You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Chester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. It's so good to be with you, beautiful to be back in Chester and um, that close to the Welsh border, but we've got better rules now, so I'm happier. Um, So that all works great and uh, so good to see so many of you in church this morning. Uh, It's bank holiday weekend, hope you've got things planned for tomorrow. If you live in North Wales, just stay at home, the English are coming probably. Um, And um, it's going to just be a great, great weekend. And uh, so good to be here. Pastor Glenn and Sophia send their love. Pastor Glenn's doing really well. Um, For those of you asking, he is on the road to recovery. There's a few little hurdles still on the way, but very positive results from the operations that he had, which we're thrilled for and thank God for. So he's back to work this week. That's your warning. Um, and um, he's back to work and, uh, and ready to be back and doing things as well. He's kind of chomping at the bit a little, a little bit because he's um, bored. So um, I found it, and then Glenn and I have been friends for, I don't know, now 30 years nearly. And he's, he's most dangerous when he's bored. So we all think we're planting two churches this autumn, but it could be five. We'll find out. We'll see just how bored he got. Um, But no, so good. So good that he's doing so well. And uh, they do send their love. And um, excited about what God's doing here. And excited for when God starts to speak to us about sort of, you know, planting that way. Because that would be exciting. It's something that we can do that, that makes a real impact right across the coastline. We do believe that's part of what God has for us as a local church. Um, that the church should always be growing. The church should always be expanding. There's always a more in the heart of God because he loves everyone. God's not looking for churches to retire and shrink, and shrink back, but to push forward. So we're, we're excited about all that is going on. We are talking today about, it's the last of our summer unlocked, and it's purpose unlocked. And Lee said earlier, we're talking about living on purpose, living on purpose. Quite a few years ago when I had hair, we were trying to save money. And uh, one of the things, laugh too hard, one of the things that we did in order to do that was, I said to Julie, I said, babe, I'm going to buy a set of clippers and you can cut my hair. And she's like, I am not doing that. And so I persuaded her using my brilliant persuasion skills. And eventually she broke. And she said, okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll cut your hair. And she says, how would you do it? I said, it's dead easy. You're just going to do it. You're going to do it all, all one length. Just you put the guard on and then you use the clippers and you, you just cut, cut my hair. It's that simple, just like, I've seen it a thousand times looking in the mirror. It's easy, right? Just, it's fine, it's fine. So she goes, oh, okay, okay, okay. So I sat down, we were actually in our bedroom, and, um, and, um, and she grabs these clippers, plugs them in, and, uh, and I hear her fiddling around with the guard, and then, and then I hear this, and I thought, she never felt like that before. And she went, oh, and I went, Babe, what have you done? Shh. You all right there, Kerry? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. I, I said, what have you done? She goes, what, what, how important's the guard? I started to reach round. I had long flowing locks at the time. I started to reach, and there is a stripe down the middle that is as short as my hair is now. She literally cut this straight hours. I could feel it, you know. I'm Bruce Banner, but the Hulk is coming. I, I, I could feel it. I'm like, mm. and then she said, I'm sorry, it was an accident. And you're done. I'm done. I got nowhere to go with it. I can't get cross with her. It's just, it's just an accident. It's pure, pure and simple accident. At least she's held to that truth now for nearly 20 years. It's just, it was an accident. I'm like, oh, okay, so, you know, I have to go and go to a hairdresser and pay a lot more money than I ever was going to to get the thing fixed. And, uh, and uh, here I am now. Uh, I do this myself. I don't even need her anymore. It's so easy. Um, and, and so he got accident, accident purpose, something on purpose, something by accident. It massively changes how you interpret what happened. 
we're in the process of looking to move house, so we've been decorating and doing all sorts of bits and pieces. And we got a new carpet laid just before we went on holiday. We just had two weeks on holiday and a real holiday. Like, I hate this staycation thing, right? People who tell me I'm going on a staycation, you can't go and stay at the same time. I'm going on a staycation. Oh, you're staying at home? No, no, no. I am going on a staycation in the United Kingdom. No, no, no. When I was growing up, we called that a holiday. That means I never went on holiday till I was 21. My parents have abused me, obviously. That's what happened there. It's interesting when you look at it. So we were going on holiday in England and... um, and we just got the carpets done. And I said to, we said to our son, 19-year-old Ethan, if you've never met my son, he, on, the, on, the, on the VT that runs the start, there's a drummer with really long hair who swings it round. That's my son. Isn't that funny? And uh, I regularly say to him, this is genetic. Um, so he's staying at home. And we say to him, listen, Eth, new carpet, you're not allowed to eat in the lounge. Right? So new, you're not allowed to eat in the lounge. It's, it's just, it is not happening. You do not, eat, got it, got it. So Julie has that conversation with him, and then I have the same conversation with him. Oh, mum's already told me that. Yeah, I know mum's already told you that, but I'm telling you again, you're not to eat in the lounge. So, so we come back from holiday. It's pristine. I'm like, m- miracle. Miracle has happened. So we go, man, that's well, just so well done, so well done. After about two days, he says, well, actually, he says, what happened was, for the first two days, I didn't eat in the lounge, but I missed the telly. You missed the telly. He said, so, you know, I ate in the lounge every day. Then Julie started looking at the carpet more closely. There was one or two spots that were really clean. (laughs) That's all we're saying. There is a big difference between living on purpose and living by accident. Listen, you don't want to live an accidental life. Where life is made up of response to what happens as opposed to a purposeful life where life has a sense of direction. Have you ever had that sweet spot moment in your life where you think to yourself, this is what I was born to do? Like, you know, Ronaldo's about to run out at Old Trafford again. That's what he was born to do. Or, you know, Michael Jordan gets the ball with three seconds to go in a Chicago Bulls game. That's what he was born to do. Pastor Glenn preaching on enthusiasm at Audacious Church. That's what he was born to do. My wife talking about well-being. Uh, Matt Dickinson with a spreadsheet. That's what they were born to do. Any one of those things that you look at and go, that is, that is the very thing that they were supposed to do. But have you ever realised that you don't get to do that every day of your life, whoever you are? And it seems that we make purpose this thing that is both far away from us and hard to find. That we make what almost that big question, and after pastoring for 30 years, this big question, the pastor, tell me, what is God's plan for my life? Or what was I born to do? How do I find out my purpose? Well, the answer to that question is, it's not as narrow as you think. Because I think what happens is we limit it to this. And we say, if, if I do this, then I fulfill God's plan for my life. And I think God sits back and goes, i got way more for you than that. But you've tried to live in this tiny little sweet spot. That it's got to always be that moment that feels purposeful. So what we want to do is unlock purpose. We want to say to you today, in every part of your life, in every way you live, it's possible to live day in, day out, moment in, moment out, full of purpose. It's not about what's happening, it's about who you are. And if we can unlock that in our lives, it is amazing. It's amazing me the number of people who say to me, but the Bible says that it's a narrow way to follow Christ. Actually, it's not a narrow way. There's only one way to follow Christ. That's acknowledging him as Lord. But once you've made the step following him, the path broadens out massively into all that he has for you. Listen. We're going to read from Jeremiah, chapter 32. Jeremiah is speaking to God's people after they have been taken into exile. So they have been defeated in war and the survivors have been taken into exile. This is not God talking to a people going, hey guys, living your best life, aren't you? 
You know, they're not, they're not sitting there by the rivers of... Riv, rivers? What is a river? By it's somebody who tells a lot of jokes. By the rivers of Babylon, they're not sitting there saying to themselves, oh, this is a beautiful place to live. These people are desperate to get back to Jerusalem. It's interesting. And uh, the, in the Audacious Foundation, we do a lot of work with refugees. Here's the story that happens every time. Everybody wants to go home. You never meet refugees who just go, oh, I'm so glad we live in England. Every single conversation I've ever had, and I have had many of them, predominantly with Syrians, just go, we, want to, we just want to go home. We'd like our land to be peaceful, and we'd like to go home to where we're from. And these Israelites are sat having the same conversations. And this is what God speaks through Jeremiah. Verse 36, Jeremiah 32. Now I want to say something more about this city, talking about Jerusalem. It will fall to the king of Babylon through war families. But this is what the Lord says. I will bring my people back again from all the countries where I will scatter them in my fury. I'll bring them back to the very city and let them live in peace and safety. And then this is the key verse for us. The key two verse, sorry. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one purpose. When people ask the question, what's God's plan for my life? It feels like the question is about me. What's God's plan for my life? I think the better is, question is, what's God's plan? Where does my life fit into it? Because we change the subject of the conversation to God's plan, not my life. And it allows us to live the bigger life because God's plan is always bigger than the life you're going to live, but your contribution to God's plan can be bigger than the life you would choose to live. So he says there's one heart, one purpose, to worship me forever. Simples. To worship me forever. And then he says, for their own good and for the good of all their descendants. For your own good, the best thing you can do with your life is worship God forever. Growing up, one of the scariest things that was ever told to me was that heaven was a continual church service. terrified me Jen I thought to myself not sure I want to go it wasn't about the quality of the church we were in it was just the thought of being in church eternally just every day you never get out you never go anywhere it's just this someone's always singing or reading or preaching and I am going to sit in that forever eternally world without end That's not what Jeremiah is saying, that our purpose is to worship him forever. So how do we unlock our purpose? In the film Chariots of Fire, a real man, Eric Little, is quoted as saying these words. God, sorry, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. He won the 1924 Olympic 400 meter race. And in winning that race, the best in the world he was. Yet his purpose was not about his sweet spot. His purpose was about his life. He had an understanding that his life was more than the sweet spot where he felt good. I want to talk to you about the five opponents of your purpose. Because if you can defeat these opponents, then you can live free. Live free in your purpose and go free. Is that okay? Is that okay, everybody? Wonderful. Okay, number one is this. The first opponent of your purpose is this. The distraction of my circumstances. Circumstances are incredibly distracting. We all know that because we've all been distracted. It is amazing where you find yourself, I'm definitely going to do this now. This is what I'm doing. Julie and I sat out yesterday to do the garden. It is not done. We said we're going to do the garden. Let's do the garden. And then, you know, Julie did something and I, I, did, I, I got things out of the shed. Right? <laughs> I got them out of the shed and I put them in the middle of the garden, like tools. I put them in the middle of the garden. We said, we're going to do the garden. And then, um, and then we, um, 
we started talking because we wanted to move out. We started talking about a house that I'd seen. He said, oh, you better show me. So we went inside and, you know, out came the iPad and we looked at this house. And, you know, we looked at the house, looked at the floor plan. We looked at the map. Uh, we looked at all the pictures. Then we looked at the video walkthrough. Then we kept pausing the video walkthrough to look at things that the pictures didn't show us. And then we said... We should probably go and look at this house. So then we got in the car and we drove to this place. We looked at the house. We liked it. We liked the house. We liked the area. It's very nice. Then I phoned my brother, who's a copper, to find out what the area is really like. Because <laughs> you want inside information. Sometimes I'm saying, listen, we're looking at a house. Don't tell mum. Don't tell me mum. Okay, nobody tell me mum. She doesn't know we're moving yet, all right? Don't tell me mum. And, um, and we're looking at this house. And um, what do you think of the area? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all right. Yeah, that's probably good. Which bit of that road? This road. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fine. Yeah, good. Yeah, no, no. No, no. You'll get the odd break in, but that'll be fine. All right, great. So, you know, get off the bro, again, drive home. And then one of our kids phones and says, hey, we're going to come home for dinner. He's, no, do you want to eat with us tonight? So I say, are you invited us? They go, no, we're coming to your house. So I said, yeah, 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 fine. So, so they came to our house. We, we had dinner together. And, uh, and as we're eating dinner together, my son-in-law says, hey, listen, I bought a Sky Pass. Do you want to watch Chelsea City? It's Chelsea Liverpool. I said, yeah, I'd love to watch that game. So we sat down and we watched that game. And, uh, and Liverpool uh, should have won and didn't. And um, so we watched that game. And then about nine o'clock, I thought, I should go and put those tools away. <laughs> Circumstance distracts us massively. Massive. What is wrong? For the love of Jehovah, what is happening to my mouth? We get into survival mode. Something happens, we get into survival mode. And we get out of discovery mode. When we're in discovery mode, we're looking for opportunity. If we're looking for things that we go, I'd love to do that, be a part of that, and get involved in it. When we get in survival mode, we do that. And what we think to ourselves is this. We think to ourselves, hey, I cannot do what God has called me to do because of what is happening to me. But you look at other people and you say this, and I know because I do it as well. You think if they were going through what I was going through, they wouldn't worship like that. You look at Sarah. You look at the team. You look at, you know. <laughs> right? It, circumstance. It's all, did I do that then? Oh, we're not videoing that. It's all circumstance. And, and we give ourselves reasons to let ourselves off living on purpose. We don't know what other people are going through. They could be going through the worst day ever, but they just made a choice to worship. Uh, their marriage could be falling apart, making a choice to worship. Kids could be absolutely off the rails, making a choice to live for God. Uh, the, the job is, is going tomorrow. That's the last day, but they're making a choice decision. We do not know circumstance, but what we do know this is you just have to hang in when circumstances are not in line with your life. Yeah. And what are you hanging in for? Because how do we overcome circumstance? You hang in for hindsight. Because yeah. I have discovered every time I have gone through the bad seasons... That when I look back on it, I recognize the hand of God in the midst of it. But I never, ever see the hand of God in the middle of it. He's too close to me for me to see what he is doing. I have to remind myself that that's where he is in the middle of it. But I have to know that he has got me. But I can't see it until I get further down and I look back and I go, God, there you were. Oh, there you were. And there you were. And we got through. How do you deal with circumstance? Hang in for hindsight. How do you deal with number two? The focus of your attention. Because your, your purpose is opposed by where your attention is focused. There's three ways that we focus our attention. Number one, it is stolen or it's caught. Your attention gets stolen by something. Number two, it's something you've given your attention to. And number three, it's something you pay attention to. Let me make it simple. We need to pay attention to what we give attention to. We need to pay attention to what we give attention to. David has been anointed king by Samuel. Saul, the present king that he will take over from, is trying to kill him. And David flees to Gath. The Bible tells us he left Gath. And then escaped to the cave of Adullam. His brothers, his father's household heard about it. They went with him. All those who were in distress or debt or discontented gathered round him. And he became their commander. 
It is his attention has been completely taken away from being king. Why? He became their commander. It does not say he became their king. So he changed his role to suit the attention that was being given to him. No one was treating him as a king, so he acted like a commander. We have got to understand that what is going on in those moments when your attention is being diverted is taking you away from your purpose. Now, we've got to take on board that David at this point is dealing with those three things, the the distressed, the in-debt, and the discontented. There's every good reason to do that. But in doing it, in being, having his attention taken by a good cause, he is not living in his purpose. See, we can find ourselves distracted by good things and not living where God wants us to be. You have got to ask the question, what have I chosen to give my attention to? And is that where God wants me to focus my life? How do we overcome that? We overcome it with our confession. So David gets a word from the prophet who says this, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go to the land of Judah where he's supposed to be the king. And it says, so David left. You've got to have those moments where you make your confession. I'm a commander here, but I'm supposed to be a king there. If I'm supposed to be a king there, I need to go there, not live here. Because what started out as a good cause would become, could become a comfortable place. And we've got not to allow ourselves to do that thing. Confession. You start to speak, that is not who I am. That is not the purpose of my life. That is not what I am about. And then you align your life behind your words. You align your life behind your words. Number three is this. What opposes us? The security of your isolation. We've been doing Couch to Community these last nine weeks. Why? Because we have got to break in us what lockdown taught us that locking yourself away keeps you safe. We've got to break that because although it was true of a disease, it is not true of life. We've got to make sure that we don't allow ourselves and we do it when we feel out of control. When life out there is out of our control, we take every bit of control we can in here. We look after our own. We stay in our house. We make sure it's okay. It's good. We've got what we need. We're all right, Jack. And we stop living the bigness of the life that we're called to live. We need to kill the isolationist spirit that can easily rise up when things are difficult. The Bible tells us this. One man can chase a thousand. Two can put 10,000 to flight. That when you live in your oneness you stop someone else being all they were called to be as well. Every time we lock ourselves away, it's not just us who suffers. It is the rest of the church who is not, we are not operating our best when you choose to not be here. We're not operating our best when you choose to not participate, when you choose to not engage. We're all made less by that. Isolation causes that to happen. How do we break isolation? It's easy. It's called proximity. Just turn up. Proximity, be with people, connect to people, yeah. invite people into your life, in, in, choose people you'd like to invite into your life and invite them into your life. It's called making friends. <laughs> Just decide, this actually, this is going to work. We're going to make this work. Do you know how Pastor Glenn and I became friends? Uh, we happened to meet because I was visiting the guy he was working for. And he said, you two should hang out. And so we went, okay. We had a coffee. It was all right. And then I went home. I said to Julie, I said, Bib, there's this really nice guy who's come to Sheffield. We should hang out with them. So we called them. I said, hey, you remember me? I kind of, we met and had a coffee. He said, yeah. He says, how about we come and have a weekend with you? That's literally what we did. How about you come and weekend with you? He says, yeah, all right then. So we went and stayed with them. I think we told them we had a child. 
you know, we arrived, uh, the two of us, and, and our eldest was, you know, she was just under one, and connected. That is what proximity does. Because that proximity set up so much purpose. Because of everything that we have then done together since, what was it? Did I feel God speak to me? No. Was there a verse in the Bible, seeketh thou glinneth? No. <laughs> it just was not there. I just thought, yeah, he's a nice guy. We get, I think we get on. And then we kept. Built. You do not know what is about to happen because you choose to pursue some proximity. Chase after it. Number four is this. The comfort of my offence. What stops you reaching your purpose? Becoming comfortable being offended. Because that's where we go, okay, I can't have anything to do with them, can't have anything to do with them. They've offended me, they've offended me. I might have offended them, better keep away from them as well. And all of those things sit there. Can I tell you something we have got to do to live to the purpose of God as for our lives? Forgive. You've got to let it go. And you've got to, I wish, I wish I could give you something more complex, but it's not, it's simple. You've got to let it go. Whatever it is that stops you living full life, let it go. And can I suggest that if they don't know you're upset with them, you don't have to go and tell them. I'd like to chat to you. Why? I've been holding an offence against you. Really? What did I do? They tell you and you think to yourself, I don't remember doing that. Now you've, got an, now you've given them an issue with you. A few months later, they're going to come back see you and go, I need to tell you, I was really offended when you came to see me, but I've forgiven you now. Just, if they don't know, just deal with it yourself. But if they do know, now you have a biblical responsibility to go to that person and go, hey, will you forgive me? Why am I not living life on purpose? Well, maybe you're carrying some things that don't allow you to pick up your purpose very well. Forgive. Number five, what else blocks us? The underwhelming nature of our ordinary. That we look at our lives and we go, wow, if I had that bigger life, that wider life, that wilder life, then that would be, oh, that'd be it. I would find my purpose in that. My favorite childhood story in the Bible is the story of Naaman. Naaman, the army commander of the Assyrians, he comes to the people of Israel because a little girl tells him about the prophets. And it's incredible when you think that through. And then he comes and he comes to Elijah and he says, hey, I need to get healed. And he says, yeah, no problem. Just go and bathe in that river. And he says, he, Naaman blows a gasket. I mean, you don't become an army commander because you're a calm guy, right? He blows a gasket. He's like, I'm not doing that. My rivers at home are better than that. That's just ridiculous. I thought he'd tell me to do something heroic. And they servants, they say this to him in 2 Kings 5. My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be clean? Listen, it is in your ordinary that God is working your purpose. While we are on holiday, um, Julie and I, we went and stayed with her parents for a few days and we decided to do a long walk, not with her parents. Those two things are not connected. And um, we thought we'd go from Bournemouth. They live on the south coast. From the pier at Bournemouth, we're going to walk back to Swanage. Julie's dad tells me, it's 10 miles max. I said, oh, okay, great, no problem. So we're having a great time. We're walking along, we're walking along the front of the beach. It's a beautiful golden sand. It was a beautiful day. And just right, not too hot, brilliant. Walking along, coffee, have a coffee on the way. Stop for another coffee here. Coffee, walk, coffee, walk, coffee, walk, toilet. Coffee, walk, toilet, toilet. Coffee, toilet, toilet. And it kind of went on like that. And then we get to the end of the beach and we have to, you have to cross on a ferry and we get to a beach called Studland. And um, this beach sort of runs round in a little arc like that. And, uh, and um, we'd forgotten, we knew it, but we'd forgotten in the moment that about two and a half kilometres into Studland Beach, there's a kilometre, a literal kilometre that is a naturist beach. 
So we're walking along and, and, and I'm walking along. We're just chatting away about life and stuff. And, and, um, and uh, I look up and I see the sign. I think, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Just, uh, you, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's not a hot day. I mean, it's a nice day, but it's not a, it's not a hot day. And you're walking along and, and you're like, oh, Lord Jesus, no. And you kind of like, you know, that Bible verse, do not turn to the right or to the left. I, I, I spoke that verse out all the way for that one kilometre. I'm like, don't turn to the right or to the left. Oh, he's coming out the sea. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, it, just, it was just like that for about a kilometre. And then, and then we get to the end of this beach, right? And there's a hill. And I look at my Fitbit and we have done 10 miles. And we have to go up this hill along a ridge, down the other side, and at least another mile at the other end. I'm like, you are joking. Your dad said it was 10 miles. This is 10 miles now. So what are we going to do? We're not going to live here. We're just going to keep walking. It is in the nature of the ordinary that we go beyond what God ever asked of us. That we find ourselves, wow, I'm just keeping going. I'm just going to keep going. So we went up the hill, along the ridge, down the other side. Got back to Julie's parents' house. I pointed to the 15 miles on my watch and didn't speak to my father-in-law for half an hour. Then I forgave him, right? This is the truth, though. you just got to keep going. If you're waiting for the aha, wow, amaze moments, you've just made our faith into a show God meets us in the ordinary and asks us to walk with him through it how do we deal with it perseverance you've got to find the miracle in the mundane just keep showing up keep turning up keep doing it so how do you live a life on purpose well I suggest those five simple things perseverance proximity confession and forgiveness and just hang in just keep going Proverbs 19.21 says this many are the plans in a person's heart but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails God has one purpose that we worship Him forever for our own good our plans, chop and change, come and go, move them around, do something a little different, but trust him in his purpose. What is our worship? What does that look like? Well, what is your act of worship to the Lord? Lee suggested it earlier reading Colossians 3, whatever you do for the Lord, work at it. Let me suggest to you that my act of worship is my singing in a service it's my giving in the offering it's my serving through what I do it's my attending small group and and my response to preaching that's part of my act of worship also part of my act of worship is feeding the poor clothing the naked housing the homeless visiting the prisoner welcoming the stranger serving the least the lost and the lonely do you know what else is my act of worship it's parenting my children it is loving my wife and it's how I act when I go to work on Tuesday morning what else my act of worship it's starting a new business it's going to university it's having a holiday is part of my act of worship and one day how I use my time in retirement will be an act of worship you see when God talks about purpose and he says that our only purpose is to worship him forever it's because heaven is not one long church service It is us living our lives with God in all that we do. Your worship is your work, your relationships and friendships. It's how you treat yourself is an act of worship. And when we grasp that, we realize we could live our lives in purpose, on purpose, every day. We had a conversation on a holiday, walking along, another part of the beach where we said hey what do we need to adjust in our lives so that we don't need to take a break from our lives what needs to change 
so that we can feel a sense of we're just living on purpose in everything we do. And I want to encourage you, you as an individual, you as a family, how do you live on purpose every day? What does that look like? How is today an act of worship once we leave this room and there's no music playing? What does that look like? Because if we can unlock living on purpose, there is a joy and a freedom we find in that that is not attached to anything else. Can I pray for you? Amen. Hey, why don't you stand to your feet for a moment? And I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for just the chance to be with you. We thank you that we do get to gather and worship and enjoy your presence together. And we pray over our lives. May we learn to walk in purpose for the sake of the impact of you upon the world. May there be change and transformation through what we do by who you are. May our lives be an act of worship to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, grab your seats a moment. I'm going to take just a few more moments to do something else while everybody sits down. If you're here today and you've never made a first-time decision to follow Jesus, then I would love to include you in a prayer. You see, this whole thing of living a life on purpose is because Jesus lived with purpose. The Bible says that he was so determined to do what he did, nothing could distract him. He was full of his purpose. And his purpose was to die on the cross for the bigger purpose of you being in a relationship with God. When Jesus died on the cross, it was about paying the price for the things we do wrong because God is so holy, he couldn't be near us. But Jesus came between and made a way so that we can know God. His purpose was to give us purpose. If you've never made a decision to follow him, or maybe you did at one point in time and you know that how you're living is away from God and you realise, I want to live for God. I need to be forgiven and I want to live forgiven in my life. Then I'd love to include you in a prayer. So if you don't mind everybody bowing your heads for a moment and we do this to give everybody that moment of privacy and to know who I'm including and I'll know in the sense I'll see the person but I won't know you personally then if you just want to pop your hand in the air and say, hey, Stuart, that's me. Would you include me in this prayer? Then I would love the privilege of praying for you. If that's you, dead quick, just pop your hand up. Then I can see it. That's so good. Anybody else? Yeah, so good. Anyone else? You just want to take this moment saying, yep, ah, brilliant. So good, man. Okay, just want to give you a few more seconds. Don't want you to miss the moment. God has a plan and a purpose and you fit right into it. He knew you'd be here today so that you could encounter him. Do you want to join these people who popped their hand up already? Then I'd love to include you and then I'm going to pray in the next sort of three seconds. That's you. Just two seconds. You don't want to miss the moment. Okay, Father, we thank you for people who just put a hand in the air to just acknowledge that they want to connect with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross, that your death on it provided such incredible freedom for us. And we pray that we use that freedom to live for you. Pray for those who just raised a hand, Lord. We pray that they will know forgiveness of sins and that they will know freedom in their life and your presence with them now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m.